What's up YouTube, Jason here with Jason Bites Back, episode number quattro eight -o. If you guys are not familiar with Jason Bites Back, it is the series of which I go back and answer questions or comments posted from the last month. Today's episode is number 48, and as always, this is brought to you by my awesome Patreon subscribers, $5 plus of which will be listed at the end of this video. Before I jump too far into this video, I do want to talk a little bit about some upcoming projects, one of which I mentioned last video, which is, I think I mentioned last Jason Bites Back video, is the Ubiquity stuff. So I have Unify UDM Pro and a Switch, and I'm pretty much just waiting on access points in order to like completely go full bore on my system. So I'm still waiting. I've ordered them. I have not got them because I want the long range Wi-Fi sixes. So yeah, that's where I am. I'm literally just waiting to get all the pieces to that puzzle before I put it together. I've also been meaning to build a rig that features a 3090 in it, but since I've been kind of using that for mining while I wait for that video, I have since melted my thermal pads and had to order new thermal pads. So before I could build that, I have to replace all the thermal pads, which ultimately should help the memory, you know, cooling on that card significantly, which should increase profitability. I know everyone hates miners, but you know, if you do happen to get a card on your hands from SRP and you want to, you know, have it pay for itself, it's like, why not? And even if it doesn't pay for itself, it's just one of those things where, hey, get what you can. So episode number 48 of Jason Bites Back, let's jump into the first question, which is from James. He says, does Plex Pass remove ads from movie streaming? Actually, let me rephrase that. He says, does Plex Pass remove ads from movie streaming? Well, James, the answer question is no. The Plex Movies and TVs is an ad supported platform. It's kind of its own separate thing that does not require a login, doesn't require you to sign up for anything, even an account. You can literally just go to the Plex.tv website and you can watch those. Having a Plex Pass does not change that. So uh, if you want to watch the, the show, Shows provided from Plex, they have their own arrangements in order to provide ads, just kind of like YouTube. Now, that doesn't mean an ad blocker in a browser when it works. Something like uBlock Origin, for example, worked in the early stages of the development, although I have not tested it since. But they got their own little arrangement thing going on, so Plex Pass or not, doesn't really matter. Next question is from Ophir. He said, you said in the video that, you have your that if you have your house wired, you can have better internet system. Can you make a video about this? Like what it is for a system to tie your house with. What it is the, or a system tie your house with. Well, he's talking about the Teco X20 TP-Link system that I reviewed. And basically what I said was that if I had an ethernet cable running to every Deco unit, I would have faster throughput throughout my house, which is true because the Deco Wi-Fi mesh system relies on bunny hopping signals through each unit if you don't have an ethernet backhole to connect them. So basically in my test, I was getting about 150 megabits per second down and about 40 or 60 up, pretty bad speeds because I was bunny hopping through a unit. However, if anybody wanted to get a system like this, if they were capable of wiring an ethernet to each individual unit, then yes, you're going to be able to get the maximum throughput if you are connected through that unit. This isn't going to change your ISP internet, however. This isn't going to increase your download speeds artificially. So you would still need to have faster service to your house before you could achieve faster speeds. But this is just removing or decreasing the Wi-Fi bottleneck, depending on what ISP service you have already. And really when it comes down to it, the whole convenience factor of the TP-Link systems is all about bunny hopping and you just plug it in and you go and most people don't want to run wires which is why there's a, you know, a market for that. But if you can run your own wires and you can hook everything up, there are definitely faster mesh systems that you could deploy that are basically build your own and fairly affordable, probably a little bit more expensive. But if you're going to hardwire everything anyways, you could probably get a little bit more. Next question is from Wolfstar. He says, you are comparing an enterprise access point with a home router. These things are barely, barely comparable, honestly. The home router is designed to push range to the max and handle maybe 10 to 20 clients. An enterprise access point is designed to be used alongside multiple other access points to provide complete coverage at higher speeds for significantly more clients, like upwards of 100 in some cases. Okay. You get the gist of that. I'm not going to read the rest of it, but that's exactly, that was kind of the point of that video. It was that it was weird for me to try to review and compare that system to what I've already used because it's only one unit, 
right, versus things that were sent to me before, which was one unit, but like you said, it was for home use. And it is enterprise gear. It's meant to be meshed together. It's not meant to be a standalone product for a large area. It's meant to connect a lot of people in a smaller area. And that was really the kind of the point that I was trying to bring to that video is that the ingenious software is pretty good. It kind of sucks being all cloud based, but it is pretty good. It gives you a lot of options, a lot of control on your network and a lot of reporting things. However, if you're looking for just brute force penetrating power from your Wi-Fi network, you're going to need more than one unit. And at four to $500 per unit, that's enterprise level. I mean, at that price range, you could get a lot of different options out there. And that's pretty much what I was trying to point out. Personally, in my house, I've only ordered one Unify Wi-Fi 6 long range unit. However, I am planning on trying to get at least two more because I mean, it is all about the mesh, not necessarily about the one device giving you everything. Next question is from old man PJ. If you plugged a 2.5 gigabit device into a 10 gigabit port, wouldn't it just auto negotiate a 2.5 gigabit speed? No. Next question. Just kidding, old man. Actually, it varies on the switch. The switch that I have specifically forgot, Cisco, I think, is a 10 gig, but it only has the option of 10 or one. It actually has to support the 2.5 gig. If it does not, it will default to one if it can't handle 10. So in my case, because I really did not plan on messing with 2.5 gig when I originally bought this 10 gig switch, no, I'm either 10 or one, which kind of sucks, which looking back, I sh should have probably got a better switch but it really depends. So if you are shopping for a 10 gig switch, I am kind of a believer in the whole 2.5 gig, you know, networking thing. So I would probably say it's worth looking at a switch that's gonna handle all those protocols, 2.5, 5, and 10. And the next question is from Gagnon Carl. Can't wait for the Unify porn coming. I have two access points in my house. Coverage is excellent. I have one mounted outside and I have maximum speed about 300 feet away. Not bad, not bad at all. On this one, this is more of a question. Anyone out there has used it before, but uh, he basically has an outside one mounted, like an outdoor antenna. Now, my thing is something that I'm gonna experiment with is the placement of my pucks, you know, my access points. Where can I put them near the back wall to make sure I have enough coverage to mow my lawns, you know, front and back. So I wanna be able to hit everything, every corner. I don't wanna to have to buffer on, you know, my music app. I just wanna hit everything. So my question is to anyone out there, you know, what's your experience in putting it near a wall? Have you had issues if it's close to a window or away from a window going through sheetrock and just regular siding? And is an outdoor access point worth, you know, potentially running ethernet and dropping and basically installing something like a, uh, a security camera as far as what you have to do to get, you know, the network there. So is that actually worth it? Or is that primarily for entertaining guests and, you know, having more users out there rather than just, you know, you wanna mow your tiny little lawn. But aside from that, I am really excited about getting everything switched over to Unify. And I want to do a video that basically is gutting my entire network and starting anew, with the exception of the 10 gig switch, because I still have, you know, the Cisco or whatever the 10 gig switch I have now. But gutting everything, starting anew, setting everything up, getting that nice, uh, uh, augmented reality thing where you can like have your phone up and so what every device is connected to each port little network thing going on you know just like <laughs> next question is from a man 4672 2.5 gig is such a weird standard i don't know why anyone uses it i disagree so my viewpoint behind 2.5 gig is that it needs to either be all or none i like the idea of 2.5 maybe five, but really 2.5, because it doesn't produce as much heat, it doesn't cost as much money to make, so it's more affordable to the average consumer, and it's easier to manage because it doesn't produce a lot of heat for really good performing NICs. So basically, you can get a good performing 2.5 gig port that's not gonna you know, overheat a system, Get you can shove them all into a switch very easily, and it's gonna be a lot more affordable than a full-blown 10 gig switch. And I think if everybody adopted it, that means every new motherboard that comes out, every new NAS that comes out, everything that comes out, comes out with 2.5 gig as a minimum, still allowing for one gig obviously, but 2.5 gig as a minimum 
then everybody's gonna be happier. Because 2.5 gig is literally two and a half times faster than one gig. I know that sounds obvious, but think about that. Two and a half times faster than what we are used to seeing normally. And a 10 gig connection actually takes a little bit of work to completely saturate. I mean, we're talking NVMEs on both sides type of thing. I'm not saying it's impossible or difficult. I'm just saying it takes a little bit of work to really use a full 10 gig connection. That's why I like the idea of 2.5 being a new standard. Roll it out to everything. It's like Wi-Fi 6, sure. It's not everywhere right now. Not a lot of devices use it, but we just roll it out to everything moving forward and it's going to become a new standard. So even though it's a little weird, I think it should be a thing. Next question is from Ben Savage. It's about the Blue Iris update. He says, been a year later and still waiting for a real upgrade. V5 was a money grab with lightly updated UI, really no new features. Just double the cost if you don't want remote desktop protocol. The developers behind this project are getting too comfortable and competition will swoop in. Where are plugins for license plate reading services and other AI analyst modules? I prefer UI3 anyway. Well, Ben, uh, this was actually posted two weeks ago. I don't know how long the license plate thing came out, but I did see some options in there. However, I have not used it. They also had an AI update for BlueStacks, which is supposed to re like recognize faces. I just haven't had a time to you know go through and like check that all out. I kind of enabled some stuff and then just let it go. I installed BlueStacks and just kind of let it do its thing. I haven't really had a chance to, you know, do a deep vibe, the deep dive into, you know, face recognition and things like that. So they have been updating it, but yeah, I actually kind of agree. I think there are some, you know, changes that Blue Iris could make that could help ease some of the stuff that they do. So primary example, someone brought it up on Twitter, uh, having an animated GIF, you know, for your thumbnail. That way you could easily see while you're scro scrolling through your timeline to see what triggered the event rather than, you know, one tiny little box on your phone and you're like, is that a car or a person? It would be nice to have animated GIFs generated by your server automatically that are low quality that you can scroll through and find what you're trying to find a lot easier. And it could be GIFs or whatever, HTML5, whatever standard is the easiest, but it would be nice to have small upgrades like that. And the update where you basically had to buy two copies of the uh, Blue Iris server just to be able to remote monitor it, I made a video about how ridiculous that was. I, and it ran like crap. So, you know, I only tested at the very beginning and I thought it was kind of ridiculous. So I 100% agree. Next question is from... Cheeto Keo. Okay, looking to Octoprint and add Wi-Fi to your printer. Yes. Okay, so I don't know if I'm gonna do Octoprint. I, I'm pretty sure I have a couple Raspberry Pis around here somewhere, but I, uh, I need to build a table for my 3D printing area because I'm running out of space. I have another 3D printer that I need to build and I have another one coming. So I need space, I need to build a table, and then I wanna build like something. And I have that Intel NUC that I wanna either, you know, hook up monitors to or a Raspberry Pi Octoprint, but I don't know if you need one of those for each one. So, you know, I'm analyzing some options, but the first thing and my biggest hiccup right now is just building a table out of scrap wood, which is a super expensive table anyways, because the lumber's crazy, but I need to build more space or go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy like some fairly sturdy tables for three to $400 each, which at that point I might as well just buy lumber. But yes, that is going to be a future project. Next question is from Bucket Traveler. Now he's actually talking about my 3D printer filament. He says, how do you keep them dry? I keep mine in totes with uh, desiccant, which is, I think, that drying thing until I use them. I don't have nearly the colors, though. I have four spools at a time. Well, Bucket Traveler, I don't keep them dry. And that might backfire on me in the future. Bear with me now. I sometimes believe ignorance is bliss and willful ignorance is bliss for her. Or I've been warned many times about the whole humidity thing with 3D print filament. And it's just something where it's like, I kinda sorta want to experience that before I go too hard into making sure everything is kept dry. Because maybe that's depending on, you know, your environment or where it's stored, like mine's in a basement. Is it more or less humid down here? I don't know. Basically not a problem till it's a problem and then I'll have to address it then. Next. Oh, that's actually the last one. Awesome. Well guys, like I said, the names of all $5 plus Patreon subscribers will be listed at the end of this video. If you guys have any questions or comments that you want the best chance of being featured on next month's Jason's Bites Back, make sure to leave it in the comment section down below. As always, thank you for watching. 
like and subscribe, and have yourself a good day.